Taking the First Steps with Options. I'm Rick Swope, Senior Strategist in Investor Education with E-Trade, and I'm your host for this session. Please be sure to pause the video at this point and read the important disclosures below. So what is our goal today? Our goal is to learn the basic terms and concepts to help you get started with options. The way we're going to do this is to walk through the agenda beginning with why. Why do you want to trade options? It's important to answer the question why. Then we'll look at the language of options. Next, options pricing. It's important to understand how option premiums are priced. And then we finish up this session with potential benefits and risks. So why trade options? Well, first of all, options give you leverage. Now, what is leverage? Leverage is simply a multiplied output for a given input. So for a certain dollar of input, it would be more than a dollar of output. One way to get leverage would be with margin. Margin is simply borrowed money. There are some other products that have leverage, but options have leverage. They allow you to control more with less equity. Next is speculation. Speculation is simply, I think the market's going in a particular direction and I would like to profit if that happens. Now you could speculate for bull markets, that's the market going up, bear markets when the market goes down, or even sideways markets where the market doesn't go up or down, it just moves sideways. But you think the market's going in that direction and therefore you want to speculate for profit. Next is income generation. A lot of ways to try to find income out of your portfolio. You may have dividend paying stocks. You may look at fixed income such as uh, bonds or treasuries or certificates of deposit. Options also allow you various strategies for generating income on either positions in your portfolio or cash that you keep in your portfolio. And last but not least is protection. Options may be used for risk management. So options are not always necessarily about getting profit, but about maintaining the protection of your positions. Managing risk is always an important consideration in all types of trading and investing, and options may serve in that type of strategy. Now let's talk about the language of options. There's actually a language around options, and just like you would learn another language, how do you do that? You start with a single word, then you learn a couple of words, and you figure out how to put them together. Next, you're speaking sentences and then phrases, and ultimately, you're conversant in that language. We're going to do the same thing with options here. We're going to learn some important terms or words within the language of options. So let's take a look at that. We call this the anatomy of an option trade. Basically, you've got a buyer and a seller and the option that's being traded. Let's look at the different parts of this trade and some of the terminology around this. First of all, let's begin in the middle column labeled option. Now, stocks are traded in shares. You can buy one share, five shares, a hundred shares. Options, on the other hand, are traded in contracts. And one contract generally represents 100 shares of the underlying stock. Now, there may be some exceptions to that, but there are just that. They're the exception and not the rule. By and large, when you see an option contract, it will represent 100 shares. Now, it is, in fact, a legal contract. As with any legal contract, the, there are certain rights and obligations that attend to the contract. And the same holds true with options, and we'll speak to that in just a moment. Now, a characteristic about all options is that they eventually expire. Now, some may expire in as short a time as, say, a week. Others may last a month or two months or several months. Then there are some others that will last for a couple of years. But regardless, the point is that every option will eventually expire. You will find what that expiration date is before you buy or sell the option. It's not a surprise to you. But you need to be aware of the expiration date and the fact that options are valid until they expire. Once they expire, then there's no value to that option. Now let's look at the left side here and talk about the buyer. The buyer is the one who is buying the option, which means that individual is paying 
the option premium. The buyer pays a premium and you know what the premium price is. You'll see in the list of the options as you go to look at them, they're called the option chain. There may be a price that says $2.75 and that's the quoted option premium. Now understand that that's $2.75 per share. As we just spoke about, one option contract equals 100 shares. Therefore, if you were to buy that option, you're not going to pay $2.75. You'll pay $275. As the buyer, you have rights. Here's an important point to remember. Buyers always have rights. And since you have the right as the buyer, you have the choice of if and when to use that right. If you choose to use that right, that's called exercising the option. The question you might have at this point is, well, the right to do what? All right, let's talk about that. There are only two kinds of options. There are calls and there are puts. If you trade an option as a buyer or seller, it will be either a call or a put. There is no third choice. So understanding that if you buy a call option, you have the right to do something. Remember, the buyer always has the rights. The right to do what? Well, in the case of the call option, the buyer has the right to buy stock or whatever that option is associated with. Sometimes it may be an option on, for example, an exchange traded fund, in which case you would have the right to buy shares of that ETF. The put buyer also has rights. The right to do what? Well, the put buyer has the right to sell stock. You see, there are only two things you could do in the market. You're either a buyer or a seller. And recognizing that when you buy an option, you have the rights, that means you have the right to do one of two things, either buy or sell. So just remember the call buyer has the right to buy. The put buyer has the right to sell. Let's take a look at the seller now. The seller receives the option premium. So remember the buyer pays the premium, the seller receives the premium. As such, the seller now has obligations. Remember the buyer has rights, therefore the seller has obligations. If you receive money, you're going to have an obligation to do something. Now the question is, obligation to do what? If you're called upon to fulfill your obligation, it's what we call are assigned. You're assigned the responsibility or the obligation to do something. With a call option, you have an obligation to sell. Now let's put it together and look at the call option together. The buyer has the right, the seller has the obligation. The buyer gets to buy, the seller must sell. You see how that matches up? Rights go with obligations and buys go with sells. So let's consider the put option. The buyer of the put option has the right to sell. The seller of the put option has an obligation to buy. Once again, we see that rights and obligations go together and buys and sells go together. Now let's take a look at options pricing. For this, we're going to use something that's probably a little bit familiar, cheese pizza. You've seen a coupon and you understand how a coupon works. In this instance, we have the right to buy one medium cheese pizza for $10. And that coupon expires on December 31st of 2020. So we understand how this works. If we walk into a pizza shop and pizzas are more than $10, we can use the coupon and save some money. If we walk into the pizza shop and pizzas are less than $10, we won't use the coupon. We'll pay whatever the price is, but we'll still hold on to the coupon because there's a chance we might still get to use that coupon. And then another scenario is we walk into the pizza shop and pizzas are more than $10, but it's past the expiration date. And in that instance, even though the coupon would normally have value, it's already expired and therefore we can't use it. Well, if you understand how to buy a pizza with a pizza coupon, you're well on your way to understanding one of the basic concepts of options. Let's take a look at that. On one hand, we have a pizza coupon. On the other hand, we have what we're going to call a Walmart coupon. WMT 
is the stock symbol for Walmart. But it's not really a coupon, although we're going to see some similarities between the two. Let's take a look at that. First of all, with a pizza coupon, you get to buy how many pizzas? One. This doesn't give you the right to go in and buy a thousand pizzas. By the same token, a Walmart coupon, which, by the way, this is a call option, we can buy 100 shares. Remember when I said that a standard option contract represents 100 shares of the stock? Now, 100 shares of what? Of Walmart stock. That's the ticker symbol WMT. In the same way that with the pizza coupon, we have the right to buy a cheese pizza, with a Walmart call option, we have the right to buy 100 shares of Walmart stock. Now, you see that the pizza coupon has a price. That's the price at which you get to buy the pizza. So if the pizza is more than that price, then there's a benefit to you to use that coupon. Options also have a price that's called the strike price. And just like the price on the coupon, it's the price at which you get to buy the Walmart stock. If Walmart stock was, say, trading at $80 a share, you wouldn't want to use the coupon because the coupon or the call option gives you the right to buy it at $100 a share. doesn't really make sense to spend $100 when you get it for $80, does it? On the other hand, let's say Walmart was trading at $150 a share. Now you have this call option that allows you to buy it for $100 a share. There's a benefit to you to use the call option rather than going out and paying the regular market price for the shares. And in a similar fashion, this option expires as the coupon expires. There is a date up until which time you may use that call option. But once that date comes and goes, once the expiration has passed, then there's no value. There's nothing left there. It's expired. It's done. And you no longer have any rights or, in the case of the seller, any obligations associated with that. Let's talk now about what influences how much you would pay for an option, that is the premium, if you wanted to buy one. The first piece is what we call intrinsic value. Now, think about the pizza first of all. It'll be a little easier if you think in those terms. If you walk into the pizza shop and pizzas are $20 and you have a coupon that allows you to buy it for $10, you use the coupon and you recognize a benefit. The amount of the benefit is $10. Let's say pizzas were $15. You walk into the shop and you use the coupon. You have a $5 benefit. The amount of your benefit is what's called intrinsic value. It is how much benefit do you recognize by using that coupon? Now, let's say you walk into the pizza shop and pizzas are $5. Do you have any intrinsic value? The answer is no. And the reason is because there's no benefit to you to use that coupon. Intrinsic value is a function of how much benefit do you get by using that option or to think in terms of the coupon by using the coupon. Now, one other component of the value, though, is what we call time value. You see, when pizzas are $5 on sale and you walk into the pizza shop, you're not going to use the coupon. You're going to pay the $5 sale price. But you also don't throw the coupon away. You save that coupon for another day. So even though there's no intrinsic value right now to use the coupon, there is some value. You recognize that. Otherwise, you would just throw the coupon away. That value is called time value. It's the value that you might be able to use the coupon at some point in time. Or to think of it another way, it's the value of uncertainty. And one of the things that comes into play regarding how much time value costs is this idea of volatility. With the options, stocks that have high volatility, where the price goes up and down and there's a lot of movement, that high volatility will translate to more expensive time value. Stocks that don't have as much volatility, they tend to move slowly and there's not a big up and down movement. That low volatility tends to translate into lower time value. 
intrinsic value and time value are the two main pieces of option premium. The option price will be the sum of intrinsic value plus time value. If there's no intrinsic value, then all of the option premium is time value. And just to recap, intrinsic value is a function of the stock price as it relates to the strike price. Time value is a function of how many days are left until expiration. Also, how much volatility is there in the stock? And there are a couple other pieces that are not quite as influential, but it's important to recognize them anyway. That's interest rates and whether or not the stock pays a dividend. So all of this goes into a model, and that model is used to determine what the option premium price is. Now, ultimately, that price is determined by the buyers and sellers, but that model serves as a good guide to uh, understand where that price should generally be located. Now, let's finish up with potential benefits and potential risks. Benefits of options. You have a wide range of strategies. Options can give you the creativity to develop a strategy that works for your trading and investing style. You can buy a call and sell a call or buy a put and buy a call or mix and match different things. And so a lot of choices are available to you in terms of trading and investing strategies. Another benefit is options give you leveraged outcomes. Leveraged outcomes. So what this means is if you have a strategy that you're successful with and you employ options within that strategy, you may be able to multiply your success. Options allow for potential income generation. Uh, you may have cash and yet you're not quite ready to buy something. Consider options as a way to potentially generate income on that cash. Options may be used for risk management, for protective positions. If you want to hold on to stock in your portfolio, but you're concerned about that stock possibly falling and you want to help protect against that, then consider options. Last in this list of benefits is options may be used for all types of markets, uptrend, downtrend, or even sideways. Now, risks associated with options, it's important that you understand where your risks are. Options will always have a time limit because they always expire. Therefore, you need to understand how much time you have. It's possible to uh, analyze the market, set up a trade, and you are actually correct in your analysis, but the option expires before your trade fully develops. And so you run out of time and don't get to see the profit. So understand what that time limit uh, may do to your strategy. Leverage is a double-edged sword. It can work both ways. I mentioned under benefits that if you're successful, you can multiply your success. But now I think you appreciate that if you're not successful and you're losing money, you can actually lose money faster. So it can multiply your losses if you're not diligent in managing risk with your strategies. So just understand that leverage multiplies in both directions. Another risk is that your option may expire worthless. That goes a little bit in hand with the first point. Now, also recognize that as you learn more about options, that if you're a seller of an option, having your option expire worthless is actually not a bad thing. But that will save that for an, uh, another class. But if you buy an option and you don't pay attention to how your trade is developing and how much time you have, you may run into expiration and find out that you have no intrinsic value, which means your option is worth zero and you've lost the premium that you paid for that option. If you're an option seller, you're going to have obligations. And if you don't appreciate what those potential obligations are, that can be a risk to you. So just recognize that as an option seller, you may at any time be called upon or assigned your obligation. And as long as you understand what that is and have prepared for it, then you should be fine. But if not, that becomes a risk to your strategy. And last but not least, unrealistic expectations. It's oftentimes the case that new option traders will get a little bit carried away because of the leverage of options. Options tend to be cheaper than the stocks, so you get to do more with less money. But that doesn't mean you should get carried away with that. 
Don't don't have unrealistic expectations of a two dollar option becoming a one hundred dollar position. That's a little bit like the same mentality that goes into playing the lottery, and that's not appropriate for option strategies. Finally, what's our takeaway? Understand the basic terms and concepts to help you get started with options so that either you are ready to place your first trade or you're ready to step into the next level of education.